Hello, everyone. So tonight we'll be having an unspoken conversation about the political and social ramifications of the lack of diversity in STEM. So by the end of tonight, I would like to explain some of the consequences of these lack of di diversities, to highlight some of the contributing factors, and to suggest possible solutions. So let's begin by dissecting a court case that sought justice for the complex form of discrimination that African American women were facing. So in the late 70s, Emma de Graffenried understood that as an African American woman, she was facing discrimination on the basis of gender and also race. So in response, she and several others filed suit against the last hired, first fired discriminatory employment practices at GM. Upon review, the judge dismissed her case on the basis that GM, in fact, hired African Americans and they hired women, insinuating her claims were baseless. In reality, the African Americans that were hired were largely men who worked in the industrial sectors, and the women that were hired were largely white women who worked in the office. This brings us to the incredible Kimberly Crenshaw, a critical race and black feminist legal theorist and a professor of law dividing her time between UCLA and Columbia. While reading a judge review of Crenshaw's case, of Emma's case, she felt that the judge, that the dismissal of her case was an injustice squared. Noting that quote, without the frames that allow us to see how social problems impact all members of a targeted group, many will fall through the cracks of our movements, left to suffer in virtual isolation. Highlighting that, the judge's refusal to view the case through a proper frame, one that took into consideration the multiple forms of discrimination that African American women were facing, was a defining factor in the visibility and acknowledgement of said discrimination. In response, Crenshaw provides a metaphor of an intersection to explain this concept of intersectionality and how Women of color, and in this particular case, African-American women, stand at the center of an intersection. And in one direction, traffic flowing represents discrimination based on race. And in the other direction, traffic flowing represents discrimination based on gender. And the law, the ambulances, seem to only respond or acknowledge your discrimination when you are hurt at a single lane and not at that intersection. So when it comes to diversity of STEM, what are the consequences of speaking about only gender disparities and not race? This can result in a lack of power and barriers of access into institutions. And with the lack of power and minimal access to institutions, minority communities have little advocacy. And when we have no one advocating for minority communities, especially at an institutional level, we see exploitation of these communities. Here we have a headline from the Harvard School of Public Health that reads, zip code, better predictor of health than genetic code. And I think this highlights the solid correlation of zip code and life expectancy. On the left, we have a map from Baltimore City Health Department of life expectancy in years from 2013. Areas in red have a life expectancy of 66 to about 70 years, while areas in green have a life expectancy of 76 to 85 years. The map on the right is from the 2010 census, depicting the distribution of African American residents in Baltimore City. And the areas in beige have a makeup of 21 to 40 percent of African American residents, and the areas in red have an 80 to 100 percent makeup of African American residents. And quite strikingly, we can see an overlap of these red areas, demonstrating that African Americans have some of the lowest life expectancies in Baltimore City, simply based on zip code. Alternatively, we see that the areas comprised of white neighborhoods surrounding the financial business districts or the National Harbor remain largely unaffected and still have rather long lifespans. And again, we have two maps of Baltimore City. This time on the left, we have a map from the American Community Survey of the percentage of children living in poverty from 2008 to 2012. 
And on the right, we have a map from the Baltimore Health Department of the cases of elevated blood lead levels in children aged 0 to 6 years old. With the red dots representing lead levels 10 or higher and yellow dots representing levels 5 to 9. And as we can see, again, there's these overlapping patterns on the east and west sides of the city, while the National Harbor and the financial business districts remain largely unaffected. But I want to stress that this isn't just a Baltimore problem. Here we have headlines from several publications and news magazines that says, for instance, from the American Journal of Industrial Medicine, posts pesticides present in migrant farm worker housing in North Carolina. Fortune Magazine posts, if you're a minority and poor, you're more likely to live near a toxic waste site. And I'm sure everyone heard about the Standing Rock Sioux protests. The New York Times posts, battle over an oil pipeline, teaching about the Standing Rock Sioux protests. In a maybe lesser known headline from a 2016 February article from BBC reads, Peru's oil spill pollutes Amazon rainforests used by the indigenous peoples. And this was an article in response to an oil spill in the Amazon rainforest, affecting at least eight different communities and leaking over 3,000 barrels of crude oil. By the end of June 2016, about halfway through the year, Petro Peru, the state-run oil company, will have already had three oil spills into the Amazon River. And according to the Observatory of Economic Complexity, refined oil is the third largest export, bringing in about 1.6 billion annually to their economy, to Peru's economy. And notably so, China and the United States comprise the first and second largest international consumers, respectively. So I want you to ask yourself how differently the Dakota Access Pipeline or the pending court cases from the Global South against mega U.S. oil companies would have been handled had there been Ph.D. representation at the academic and federal levels of these minority communities. And lastly, I want us to think about how differently green technology would have come had the exact communities suffering from environmental exploitation been the ones producing the innovation needed to restore their surroundings. So to summarize some of these consequences, I want us to ask, how is scientific representation affecting minority power? And what does this mean politically? How does this affect the way women make autonomous decisions, especially when it surrounds health care or the environment uh, and reproductive rights? In what ways are minority women to advocate for their are, are minority women able to advocate for their communities? And how would access to institutions affect that power? Lastly, I want us to analyze how the lack of academic and political representation are playing into the power dynamics that exist in the United States, and how the consequences of lack of power, barriers to access, and minimal advocacy are leading to the exploitation of minority communities. So now that we understand some of the consequences of this lack of diversity, I want to talk about some of the contributing factors. And I want to mention that these are just some of the contributing factors. I mean, this whole presentation could expand into a semester's worth of learning, so understand that we're going to gloss over quite a bit. But the disparity really starts with the way that we socialize children, and this can begin by age two. School systems then add to this disparity by promoting programs that are not culturally competent and not placing equal emphasis on the arts and history as math and science as well as an overemphasis on standardized testing. And as we saw before, socioeconomic status can largely affect resource availability in communities. And when we see the communities with the least resources also happen to be minorities communities, it's quite simple to understand how this lack of representation at the academic level and institutional level occurs. Another topic that's glossed over is microaggression and how social interactions in the office can lead to conversations rooted in bias and prejudice, and how that affects minority STEM in and of itself. So what are the actual numbers? Here we have some figures from NSF, and the one on the top is titled Race, Ethnic, and Gender Demographics of the U.S. in 2014. 
And below is another NSF figure that represents the demographic breakdown of engineers and scientists in 2015. And as you can see, white men make up 31% of the non-institutionalized residents age, 16, age 18 to 64. However, they account for 49% of all STEM occupants in 2015. Asian women and Asian men account for 2.7 and 3% of residents, yet account for 14 and 7% of STEM occupations, respectively. And while white women are underrepresented, accounting for 31% of the residential population and 18, only 18% 18 of the STEM occupants, we see that the white and Asian ethnicities alone account for 88% of all the STEM occupations and only 68% of the residential population. Black and Hispanic men and women combined account for 28% of the residential population, while only accounting for 11% of STEM occupations. And when we specifically look at black and Hispanic women alone, accounting for about 4% of our STEM occupations, we see that they make up 16% of our residential population. So what role does education play in this? Well, we have K-12 and university programs that reinforce patriarchy and cultural dilution that leave students out of touch with socio-political movements and influential history. And to illustrate this point, I have two quotes. You have enemies? Good. That means you stood up for something in your life. And as some of you may know, this is from the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill who is continually referenced as a crucial leader during World War II. Next, we have a lesser heard, referenced, or even taught quote that reads, I hate Indians. They're a beastly people with a beastly religion. The famine was of their own fault for breeding like rats. And this too was Winston Churchill. And I think that this second quote sheds light on the historical dilution or misrepresentation really that we see of prominent figures in academic settings. And because the history of the inception of our universities, who built our universities, whose land our universities was built on, or who the universities were originally intended for, because the answers to these questions go largely ignored, it's evident that we don't care what those answers actually are. And what about the way that we socialize children? And how does this shape the way that they see themselves in the world? Here we have a study from PubMed, which reads, changes in elementary student perceptions of science, scientists, and science careers. And in this experiment, scientists were examining the change in perception of STEM careers after a curricular module on health and veterinary science. And I've referenced a table from the study that's measuring student perception in the form of the draw scientist test. And here we see pre and post participation scores. And when surveyed during pre participation, 65% of students drew male scientists only. And around about 90% of them were drew, drawing white scientists only. And we see that even after the curricular module, 85% of children were still drawing white scientists only. And this is a largely studied phenomenon that we will continually see white, cho white excuse me, children drawing white male scientists as the primary vision of what they see a scientist as. Which means that it's very evident by elementary school, kids have this preconceived notion of who a scientist can be, socially speaking and that the preferences and social expectations that we project onto children continue to separate them into these binaries. Here we have another study from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science in conjunction with Yale University, conducted in 2012, where scientists were trying to observe the reactions of men and women with precisely equal qualifications. And Subjects were rated on competence, hireability, and mentoring. And their studies concluded that female scientists were less likely to be hired because they were seen as less competent. 
Here we have a 2012 report from the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology titled Double Jeopardy, Gender Bias Against Women of Color in Science. And I've highlighted some of the key points that speak to the microaggression that we see in working environments. 60% of Latinas surveyed received backlash for expressing anger, feeding the common stereotype of angry Latina. We see that 48% of black women and 47% of Latinas surveyed report having been mistaken for administrative or custodial staff. And that 77% of black women report having to repeatedly prove themselves in the work environment. And the report also notes that, quote, women walk a tightrope between being seen as too feminine and so light, but not respected, or too masculine and so respected, but not liked. And I think that this quote really brings the conversation full circle to our original point, which is that the lack of diversity in STEM is an intersectional issue. And that as a woman of color, not only do you face discrimination on this choice or ultimatum really of feminine expression or respect, but you also face discrimination on the basis of race. So what can we do? Well, we can start by asking, how are you, how am I even, as a non-black minority, participating in the systems that create race and gender biases? How is our unwillingness to speak about these issues equating to the erasure of minority problems? I want you to ask yourself, is my advocacy performative? Who am I performing it for and why? Making sure that as scientists, we're not only demonstrating when our funding is in jeopardy and understanding that many of these issues began before the previous presidential election. I also want us to understand that science always has been and always will be political. So if we continue as scientists to play pretend like we are exempt from these biases, that we're in fact only reinforcing the exact biases we played pretend not to exist in the first place. And I want to add that I've just began to really scratch the surface of this conversation and I challenge everyone here to expand this conversation to members of the queer and trans community or the community of people with disabilities and try and conceptualize how their struggles may add to this disparity. And furthermore, what we plan to do on it, about it really, as a community. I'm going to finish with a quote from Sandra Cisneros, which reads, I try to be as honest about what I see and to speak rather than be silent especially if it means I can save lives or serve humanity. Thank you.